You have to love what you do. You're all young. Ideally, you'll love something that's a good business. For instance, some businesses aren't good businesses. I won't name them, but they're tough businesses. Other businesses historically have been good businesses. You have to absolutely love what you do. Ideally, love what you do in a good business, but you know what? If, you, if it's not necessarily that good, the loving is more important than having that good business. Some people want to be teachers. I mean, some of the happiest people and the most successful people that I know are people that aren't the richest at all. They don't make it all the most money. They're teachers, they're scientists. I know people that are scientists that are like, they can't wait to get to work. They can't wait. Uh, policemen, you know, our police departments are, are, I think, terribly disrespected. I think they're not given the credit for the great job they do. I have to be honest. With you. So true. And our vets and our, our people, our military. But, but I will tell you that the, the happy people are the people, number one, the people with great families, people that have great relationships with their wives or husbands, very, very important toward success. Because I don't consider success necessarily monetary, because I know the most successful people in the world. And many of these people are really miserable people, okay? No matter what, perhaps I'm in the category, okay? But I'm pretty happy. At least I'm very content, I can tell you. But some of the most successful people in the world, I know like many of them. I don't know all, I guess, but I know that I seem to know all. And they, they cross my path a lot. And they're not necessarily happy people. They're very wealthy people, but they're, in many cases, extremely unhappy. Now, with all of that, I don't want to talk you out of things because we're talking about success. Most people think success is measured in the form of monetary success. It's not really. I mean, to me, a successful person who has a great family, who loves the family, loves the, the children, and the children love him or her, to me, that's a much more successful person than a person that's made a billion dollars or ten billion dollars and is miserable and doesn't have a good family and nobody likes the person. And, you know, I've, I've seen them. I've seen every, I think I've seen every type of person there is that God created, if you want to know the truth. And the people are the happiest are not necessarily the people are the wealthiest, okay? But in terms of monetary success, it does make life easier. You don't have to worry about food and housing and education and sickness. Your doctors, you go to the best doctors and hopefully that solves the problems. But they are, it does make life easier. And I tell to so many stories about different types of people. For instance, you gotta love what you do. You gotta never, ever quit or give up. Never quit. You're gonna be so close. My father used to tell a story. He thought it was funny, but I actually thought it was more of a lesson. He viewed it as funny. And it was about a man who loved the cola business. He loved, you know, soft drinks. That's what he loved. He just loved the business. Isn't it strange how people like different businesses? Look at all these geniuses, the heads of your college. And I think you like this better than politics, too. Don't we like this better? It's politics. Oh. So what happens is he loved the cola business. And he founded a company that was called 3UP. And my father would tell this story, he'd laugh, he'd laugh, but I'd listen and I'd say, mm, I, I don't want to laugh, it's a lesson. And he found his company, 3UP, and he was very proud, but the company wasn't making it, didn't work, and he gave up, and it was just no good, and it went out of business. But he never wanted to quit, and he did another one. It was 4UP, and he did 5UP, and he did 6UP, and they would all fail, and he just kept failing, 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 and finally he gave up. And my father would say, if he only came up, if he just worked a little bit harder, just one more, he would have had seven up and he would have been a tremendous success. And I laughed because I think of my father telling me that story. And we viewed it differently. And what I viewed it is not as comedy. I viewed it as never ever give up. You know, just never give up. You can't. I view another word that you never hear when you're talking about success, and that's momentum. Some people, and you have to know, you have to know about yourself. You have to know about momentum. Some people have a great momentum. It's even like me on the campaign trail. Uh, I took off three or four days, which is a lot because I've been going for months without any, a lot of people say, unlike Jeb, you have very high energy, right? It's true. But you know, you take three or four days off and that first day or two back, it's like, you know, you gotta get going, you gotta get going. It's almost like, don't take any time off. 
vacation. If you want vacations, you're not really in the right business. I, I hardly ever take time off because I love what I'm doing, whether it's my business or whether it's now this, we're going to make America great again, and whether it's this, no matter what. But the word momentum is a very important word, and you have to understand it, and you have to understand how to think about momentum. And it's a word you never hear when you hear about success, but it's so important. And what happens is there was a man named William Levin, and I had great respect for him. He was a great real estate person. And he was a young man, and he built Levittowns. Has anyone ever heard of Levittowns? Well, Levittowns were these massive housing devel developments, uh, largely in Long Island, Pennsylvania, different places, but massive. He was really the first of the massive builders of homes. And he was a young man. He did unbelievably, became very, very rich, and everything he touched turned to gold, and it was incredible. And then what happened is he was offered a lot of money by Gulf and Western. It was a big conglomerate to buy his company. And you have to understand, William Levitt used to go around looking for nails, looking for sawdust. He'd sell the sawdust. He'd save the nails and use them again. He'd save chips of wood and use them for different things. Everything was perfect. He knew how to get zoning. He'd have lunch with the mayor. He'd have lunch with the council. He'd have dinner with everybody. He was a, the ultimate professional real estate developer, and he built Levitt Towns. Remember, he was the first really large-scale housing sprawl all over, all over the country. Actually, they went all over the world. So Gulf and Western came to him, and they offered him a lot of money, more money than he ever thought possible. And he took it, and he said, oh boy, this is great. He then retired at a very young age, very, very young. But he was going crazy. He was so bored. He was going absolutely crazy, but they had a restrictive covenant. He couldn't compete. He couldn't do what he knew best, which was building housing. And so he was retired. He moved to the south of France. He bought a magnificent yacht. Unfortunately, he got divorced and he did a trophy wife thing and, you know, one of those things. And terrible, terrible person to do that. But he did it. And, but he had a wife who was a good wife, La Belle. And he named the, the boat after her, the yacht. And he was riding high. Everything was good. Now he's getting a little older. He's still in retirement, lost his momentum, remember the word. And Gulf and Western comes back and they're dying. This is a big company, but they're dying because they don't send people to pick up nails. They don't send people to sell the sawdust. They don't send people to take the little scraps of lumber and bring them down and sell them and get very small amounts of money, but it all adds up. And they're losing their shirt with this company they bought. They couldn't get zoning because they don't take the mayor out to dinner and they don't do the things that you have to do. And they couldn't get zoning. They had all this land. They went crazy with buying land and they couldn't sell the company because it was a mess and they destroyed the company and they went to William Levin and they said we'd love to sell you the company back and he said oh he was about 12 years he was out okay he lost that whatever it is and after 12 years they came to him they said we'd love to sell you the company back would you have any interest yes I would I'd love to buy it back. so he bought this big company back bigger than what he sold he had all this land that was unzoned and all and he worked like crazy. He worked 24 hours a day. Work, 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 work. And he went bankrupt. Out of business. Totally bankrupt. The biggest. He went bankrupt. And by this time, he was an old guy. And I was at a party. And I was the new hot guy in New York. I was doing great with real estate. And I was on the covers of Business Week magazine and Fortune magazine. I was doing really well. And there was a man named Steve Ross that a lot of you folks would know from Warner Communications. And he was a hot guy in entertainment. He built Time Warner and he was a great guy. Passed away from, from cancer, unfortunately. But he was an amazing guy. One of the great people in the history of the entertainment business. And he was giving a cocktail party. He had 50 people on his Fifth Avenue apartment. And I walk into the apartment. I was invited. And I see 50 people. And most of them are in the entertainment business. And I saw one person pretty old guy and he was sitting in the corner and his name was William Levin and I went over to him because I was attracted to him because he was in my business I didn't care about the entertainment people I cared about him and I said Mr. Levin how are you doing Donald Trump he said yes I know he said I'm not doing well I'm not doing well at all I said I read that and it's too bad what went wrong and I'll never forget the expression of the statement he said Donald I totally lost my momentum.
It's a thing you've probably never heard. He lost his momentum. He took that time off, he came back, and it was a different world, and he lost his momentum. Now, the real lesson there is you have to know if you've lost your momentum so that you don't get hurt. And it's just something that I talk about because it's so different. And I watched him sitting in this corner. I don't even know why he was there because he was no longer successful. But I guess Steve knew him and respected him for what he had accomplished because what he had accomplished was amazing. He was the forerunner to so many massive developments that you see all over. But he said, I lost my momentum, Donald. I lost my momentum. I've never, ever forgotten those words. And I've always remembered that. And what you want to do is you want to keep going, keep going, keep going. But if you think you lost your momentum, slow down and refocus on maybe something else. Because it's so important to keep the momentum going. Okay? So important. So that's one of the many, many uh, elements or stories. And one quick one that we also talk about and that I talk about. There's a certain amount of luck. Does anybody believe in luck? Just raise your hand. Who believes that some people are luckier than others, right? So I have a friend who's just an unlucky guy. Just an unlucky guy. He's smart. He went to the Wharton School of Finance. He's a very, actually he's a brilliant guy, but he's always been unlucky. And no matter what happens, it just works that way. And he never really succeeded. And you'll find when you become very successful, the people that you will like best are the people that are less successful than you. Because when you go to a table, you can tell them all these wonderful stories and they'll sit back and listen. Does that make sense to you? Okay. Always be around unsuccessful people because everybody will respect you. You understand that? Anyway, but this guy, he had a thing and, and he just would be, he was just like struck. He was unlucky. And no matter what he did, he always, he was, I call him injury bound or he was just always something would happen. So he'd be injured. I said, what happened? I broke my shoulder. How did you break your shoulder? Are you a football player? He goes, no, no, I stripped, I slipped, I went down the stairs. So he's in the hospital and he's recovering in Long Island. And he comes back and he's being driven back. And again, he's always injured. He's injury prone. You know the expression? Some people are injury prone. Is anybody in this room injury prone? Raise your hand. Oh, don't raise your hand. I don't even want to say it. Don't do it. Because you'll convince yourself. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up back there. Are you really injury prone? Well, you're, you're a big, strong guy. Are you a football player or something? Huh? Well, you are. Ah, oh, come on. Okay, here's what you do. Tell yourself you're not injury prone. Sit down, okay? Look at the size of that guy. How can he be injury prone? Looks like he's on the Green Bay Packers. I mean, you know, give me a break. But this guy was totally injury prone. No matter what happened, totally injury prone. And he'd always be ill. I'd always, I'd call his wife and she'd say, oh no, he's very sick. What's wrong with him? He'd say, tell me something. I'd say, all right. So he had a broken shoulder. And now he's coming home. Think of this. He's coming home from the hospital and he's riding on the Long Island Expressway which is the longest parking lot in the world by the way he's riding on the look because it's so crowded he's riding on the Long Island Expressway and an 18 wheeler hits the signs that say to New York City 10 miles right knocks over a sign think of this it, he didn't even get hit by the truck he got hit by a sign and I call up to make sure he's okay from the previous injury and the wife says no no we were taking him home and what happened is a big truck hit the big sign, the big stanchion, and the sign came down on the road and it hit his car and now he's really in trouble and now he's back in the hospital. Well, just like that, there is a certain amount of luck. But the greatest story to me is Gary Player. Gary Player was a golfer, a great golfer, one of the great golfers of all time. And he was, they used to say he's diminutive. He was small. He worked harder than any human being. He worked harder than any other golfer, but he was a small guy. And he, but he hit it good, he hit it far. Great, great golfer. Everybody's heard of Gary Player from South Africa. Still a great guy. He's always kept himself in shape. I saw him the other day, he's like 80 years old. He's phenomenal. He still looks like he did 20 years ago. But Gary Player worked hard. And he was the first time, maybe I've heard it again, but he was the one the harder I work, the luckier I get. That was Gary Player. He worked so hard. And they'd say to him, he'd win the U.S. Open. And they say, where are you going tonight? I'm going to practice. 
I mean, he just won a tournament and he's going to practice. And I have seen people that work really, really hard. They create to a certain extent, because I do believe there could be something with the whole luck thing. But there are people that work hard. Remember that expression, the harder I work, the luckier I get. The harder he worked, he got stronger, stronger, longer, longer. He practiced putting, he practiced chipping. The guy was unbelievable. He won 18 majors, senior and regular. He won like 175 tournaments worldwide, which I think is the record. But he was a hard worker. And he used to say, they'd ask, how do you do this? How, do you, how are you so successful? He says, well, you know, the harder I work, the luckier I get. And I just think it's a great thing for all of the young people out here and the older people. Hey, I'm still working just as hard. I think I work hard. I think I'm working harder in the last eight months than I've ever worked before in my life. Believe me, but I enjoy it. You have to really work. The harder you work, remember, the harder you work, the luckier you get. So just remember those few little things. Momentum, love what you do, always love what you do, always. One final story on success, because I think it's a great thing. I have a friend who's a guy who was born to a very, very successful Wall Street baron. And the Wall Street baron is a vicious, ruthless, horrible human being, okay? You would not like him for dinner. You'd respect him, but you wouldn't like him. And most of the people in the room would know who he is. One of the big barons of Wall Street. Very, very smart, very vicious, very ruthless, more so than you'd ever see in a, in a movie. You know, they can't make movies about guys like that. And he had a son who's a really nice guy. I have no idea how he produced this son. This son is the nicest human being. And the son was in the father's firm on Wall Street. And the firm is a massive firm. And he was unable to compete really with all the young guns in the firm. And the father sort of understood it. Loved his son, but drove his son really terribly. And what happened is the son is at a club. He's a member of a country club out in Westchester. And they were doing a major, major renovation of the clubhouse and the greens and the golf course, a big, big renovation. And people sort of semi felt sorry for him almost. And they made him, they put him in charge. And he was fantastic. He was there at six in the morning and five in the morning and he wouldn't leave till nine in the evening. And the job came in under budget, ahead of schedule. The job turned out to be 10 times better than anyone ever thought. And he was so happy. His wife called me. She said, he's like a new man. He's so, so happy. He's doing this and he's so happy. But he doesn't want to leave the firm because he doesn't want to disappoint his father. I said, his father's already disappointed, just in case you have any questions. I said, he's got to get out of the firm. He's got to get out from those killers. And he wouldn't leave. And I went and met with him, and I met with him and his wife, and not so long ago. And I said, so, what are you going to do? He said, I've got to stay with the firm. I said, you're making a huge mistake. Two years later, he left the firm. He opened a construction company. He can never do what his father did, but he's so happy. He's doing nicely. He's happy. His family loves him again. They couldn't stand him. He was a miserable, unhappy guy. He could not compete. And he now goes around and renovates buildings and all. He's the happiest guy in the world. And in his own way, his father is too tough to say it. But in his own way, his father is proud of what the son is doing. So I only say, really, love what you do and remember those other little things I told you. Okay? So that's enough of success. Do we agree? Do we agree? Is that okay, Mr. Instructors? Okay?